Welcome on in golf fans, it's your boy GS Luke here with our course breakdown for this week's Masters Tournament. Gonna go through everything you need to know about Augusta National to get you ready for all this week's action. We'll start with some course details, then go hole by hole through all 18 holes around Augusta, and then towards the end of the video, some of my key stats and comp courses around the PGA Tour to give you an idea of the kind of conditions to expect, and therefore, the types of players that you wanna keep an eye on for your modeling. So by the end, you'll have all the information that you need to go out there and get your research started. So a lot to get into. Let's start it off with some of those course details I mentioned before. Augusta National is a par 72 in just over 7,500 yards. So does have some distance to it. A lot of that comes with your longer irons and off the tee is not nearly as penal as some of the other major championships. So while a US Open PGA Championship will usually hit you with that four or five inch rough, you have next to no rough out here. In fact, just under 1.4 inches is where they're cutting it off here on Monday. And on top of that, the greens are really where you get all of that penalty, whether it's the misses around the Green, which are penalized to the fullest, the greens themselves, which will lead to a lot of three putts, that's where you get a lot of that over par scoring average. So we know what to expect. We see this course every single year. So unlike some of the other majors that travel from golf course to golf course, we don't have to adjust our modeling very much um, for the Masters year in and year out. So greens pretty large, but again, extremely penal, uh, which we'll talk about a lot when it comes to the modeling. There are a few water hazards in play, but it's not like a Florida course. Uh, only in six holes do you do get that water aspect, and uh, two of those water hazards are kind of out of the way, so really just like four true holes with that water in play. Um, bent grass greens, first time we see that for really the entire schedule. That rough is that ryegrass overseed that we've seen for the last month or so on tour, and the main thing to focus on here are, you know, the low scrambling rate, right? Scrambling rate is only 52%, and that's even with the top level field here. Green alert regulation percentage is lower than your tour average despite having those large surfaces out there, um, it's all because of the undulation. There's a ton of creativity that is needed around Augusta National, and we can look at the stats all day if we wanted to, but the thing you're not going to see, right, from the numerical perspective is the strategy that is needed around Augusta National, the experience factor that comes in every single year. So we could bore you to death with these averages like we do for a lot of other events, but I don't think it's the way to approach an Augusta National. It's much more about experience experience. It is much more about um, knowing where to hit the golf ball at this type, type of course um, than it is your skill set coming in. So we're going to talk about a few key stats. Uh, of course, course history is going to be a huge part of that, but things like apex height, which we really wouldn't talk about at a lot of golf courses, but because of how firm and fast the greens are here, you have to be able to hit the ball high to get close to a few pin locations. So guys like Rory, Jason Day, Scotty Scheffler, right? They hit the ball really high. It's no surprise that they've found success at this golf course. So uh, a little bit of an anomaly when it comes to the statistical breakdown here, but you'll see over here on the bet the number model, of course, where we're getting a lot of these stat averages from, uh, they're looking at apex height this week. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later on, but Phil Mickelson, right, winner at this event before, um, is a player that really pops in that category. And if you go through this up here, right, Jay Day showing up, um, guys like Brooks Kepka who nearly won last year, right, Rory, who I was already mentioning um, there just a few minutes ago. Um, are guys that are going to pop up from that perspective. So it's a unique golf course, but we know what to expect. And with the lack of penalty off the tee, it's a lot about distance as opposed to accuracy. Iron play is up the utmost importance, and it's not just about hitting greens, but hitting the right section of the greens to go out there and find success. And then around the green play, this Dr. Alistair McKenzie design, of course, Bobby Jones helping out with it as well, um, is really dependent on around the green play. If you miss in a bad spot, which is inevitable, right, at this kind of of golf course, you're going to have to have the best short game, the toppest, you know, the most elite possible short game possible uh, to be able to get up and down around here. So you see that with the scrambling rate, right? Some of the up and downs can be manageable, right? If you're missing in the right spot, but if you are a little bit too aggressive to some of these pin locations, uh, that scrambling rate is probably closer to like 15 or 20%. And unless you're, you know, a Roy McIlroy, somebody like Tiger with hands of absolute magic, um, Jordan Spieth, of course, right? Known for that in his career, um, you're going to have a really hard time with some of those shots. So it's a golf course where you have to have a complete game. If there's anything that's de-emphasized, it is the putting around Augusta National, because even your best putters struggle from seven to eight 
feet feet here. They're, uh, the greens have so much undulation on them. They run so quickly that almost all of your misses lead three, four feet past the hole, right? And uh, if you get them with perfect speed, you have to play like three or four feet of break, even on a sub 10 foot birdie putt. So it's a, it's a course where even the best putters in the world tend to struggle, which is why guys like Sergio have won here, Scotty Scheffler winning um, last year, of course, um, sorry, two years ago, wasn't that much of a surprise. John Rahm didn't even put all that well last year, right? And went out there and won this event. Now the rest of the top 10, right, in general putted pretty well, but only about a half a stroke per round for John Rahm shows you that it's much more about that tee to green play than anything else when it comes to winning. So um, we could take a look at some of the data. Again, I don't think it's really a week to do that. We know what to expect from the Masters, right? Course conditions this year do look like they could be pretty windy for rounds one and two. And if so, that puts an even higher emphasis on that scrambling rate, right? Guys that can keep their round together on these really tough greens um, when you're inevitably going to miss if we get 30 to 40 mile an hour winds. Now we'll quickly go hole by hole and give you an idea of the types of shots that these players are going to face. And in general, it's a lot of long irons. And you get that with hole number one. You can take driver here, but a lot of players are going to hit either a long iron or a three wood off of this tee. It really narrows down the longer that you hit it, which leaves you normally about 150, 160 yards in. If you're a little bit more conservative with that iron, that could put you back closer to like 175 yards. And that's where you see some of that long iron play coming in. So unless you're an elite tier bomber, that is extremely confident with your accuracy, you're probably going to have a mid to even a long iron into hole number one. Hole two is a scoring opportunity. Um, hole one, I would say, is mostly you're just looking for par. Guys like Tiger Woods who have won this event after starting with a double there. Um, so it's not impossible, right, for you to make it up. But it's certainly not a hole where you're looking to make birdie. But hole two is that, right? It is a birdie look for most of the field. It's a downhill par five, uh, plays downhill the entire way down to the hole here. So a lot of times you'll see like 350 yard drives. So rather than being back here at 290, a lot of your tour pros are going to get it out there much further. And if we go ahead and set the second target on the green, right? So assuming that, that players are going to go for this in two, you'll see it's about a 223 yard shot in. So that accounts for some of the elevation change. It's probably about 190 yards adjusted here to the front of the surface. So you will get eagles here, right? Guys like Louis Oosthuizen have made an albatross out here at this hole before, and it's because it is reachable in two. Hole three is 354 yards. If this happens to play downwind, um, you could see guys trying to get it near the surface. I believe every once in a while, they'll move up the tee box um, to make this a little bit more reachable, but it is one of the more severe green complexes on all the entire property. And that's really saying something when you're talking about Augusta National. Um, over here to the left side, it is extremely narrow. A lot of times they'll use that for a moving day pin. Um, a little bit of a slope in the middle of the screen, so any front right pin is a little bit more accessible, but uh, definitely a lot tougher than it looks like on paper. It is a birdie look if you can hit a solid wedge shot, but uh, it's far from a gimme birdie. Hole number four is 247 yards. Um, long, you know, long iron needed. It's a long par three to begin with and a pretty narrow green complex. So um, just another example of the demanding nature of this golf course. It's not like it has super long rough around it. In fact, a lot of this is just shaved off fairway area. And even if you have rough here, right, it's only 1.4 inches long. So it's much more about the design of the golf course that makes it difficult than just brute strength and accuracy like you see at a few of the other majors. Hole five is 500 yards. It is maybe the hardest hole on property. A ton of people end up in these left fairway bunkers. And if you do, it's almost a for sure layup. Um, only guys like Jason D, I think uh, guys like Hoygaard may have gone down to there before. Um, maybe it wasn't Hoygaard, but it was one of those like super young, super long European tour guys uh, that I think last year was able to get themselves out of that bunker and onto the green. Um, but if it's playing into the wind, which it does from time to time, it is even more brutal than it is before. And this green, which you would think would be easier, right, because it's a 500-yard hole, has a ton of slope on it. And you can kind of see it from the overhead view here, um, this dark little patch towards the center everything feeds towards the back so if you hit it on the front of the screen which a lot of people do right long par four a lot of the two putts back to this middle or even back pin location are uh like 50 50 prospects just for getting down into it is an extremely difficult three putt uh two putt i should say really easy to three putt 
Hole number six is 187 yards, so a little bit shorter for the par three, but nothing around here is as simple as it looks on paper. Hole seven is 449, so a medium length par four. Um, six, seven, and eight, um, even nine, right? I would say are a pretty scorable stretch of the golf course, uh, but even so, right, you can see how narrow this green complex is. Hole number seven is 576, so reachable par five. Uh, re you know, the main reason I, I would say this part of the golf course is scorable, um, a lot of room to the right, right, to hitch chipping shots onto the screen, but a really narrow surface. Um, has a lot of depth, but really narrow, so hard to get the angle correct. Hole nine is 465, dog leg from right to left, um, a massive landing area, especially for your longer players off the tee, um, and another score of a look, right? I would say if the wind isn't super nasty out there, it should be for Thursday, Friday, uh, so that's why I leave with that caveat, but under calm conditions, I would say one of the easier holes out there at Augusta. If you're starting on the back, though, you're getting slapped in the face on hole number one. So just like hole one isn't, you know, a snack by any means, hole 10 is absolutely brutal. It plays downhill at least, so you'll get drives in that 320 to 350 range, which will leave you like 175 to maybe 150 yards in. But you have a really severe green complex, which there's a lot of shadows covering it. So it's hard to really get that perspective here. But uh, a raised up green where this shot to the left is one of the hardest up and downs on property where uh, you don't want to miss that green. And it's really easy to miss that green from 500 yards. Hole 11 is also brutal. It is 536 yards. So yeah, um, luckily they're sending them off of hole number one. So unless there's some crazy weather situation where they have to send them off in threesomes um, over the weekend, um, luckily you'll have at least nine holes under your belt by here. So it's 536. It is long. It's demanding. It has water to the left. And uh, once again, because it's a little bit elevated here, all of the around the green shots to the right side are pretty difficult. Hole 12 is an infamous hole here, right? This is where a lot of blowups happen on Sunday. And uh, once again, it's only 155 yards. On paper, it doesn't look that difficult, but look at how narrow, how, uh, you know, the lack of depth right over here at hole number 12. And then everything runs off into the water. You have these um, little flowers over the green, which can lead to lost balls. It is just an absolutely devilish par three. 13 is 545. You can see they have the tee box moved back and not even accounted for with some of the satellite images here. It's a, a massive dog leg from right to left. The longer players can be a little bit more aggressive around this corner. Now that they moved the tee box back, it played a little bit harder last time out, but was still one of the easier holes in property. So if you lay up, you have a little flip shot onto the screen. And uh, of course, if you are a bomber, it's going to be a little bit harder to reach you know, 13 and 2, but it is, of course, still possible. 14 is 442. It is a long, um, it's a long iron in because a lot of guys here won't hit driver off the tee. If you hit driver off the tee, you can run off into the right into the trees. Um, also, right, any miss to the left is absolutely dead if you end up overdrawing it over there. And uh, there's not a lot of incentive to hitting a driver off this tee. So you can see they have it at 290 yards. Um, does play slightly uphill, so it has that working against it as well. So, uh, you know, maybe a nine iron into the screen and uh, a large green complex. So you get that, but uh, a really difficult two putt. 15 is 558, so reachable in two if you hit a good tee shot, but uh, a lot of risk that comes into play. So you have the water in front of the green, which of course is an obvious place that you don't want to hit it, but over this green leaves an extremely difficult up and down. This entire green slopes from back to front um, in a very severe manner. Um, so anything that's over this green um, pretty much is an impossible up and down. So uh, I know Phil Mickelson was able to pull it off once off of an upslope, but it takes that type of shot, that type of player to go out there and get a, get a birdie if you go over that green. 16 is 178. This is where Tiger nearly holed out um, with a hole in one, right? The last time that he won the Masters. It's also, I believe, where he hit that iconic shot with the Nike commercial. So it's a par three. You do have the water in play and a lot of slope towards the middle that'll take shots to the left. And that's where you see um, the near hole in ones that you had for Tiger. 17 is 445. It is a medium length par four. Uh, again, a lot of guys here aren't going to hit driver because of how much it pinches down there um, the further you get it off the tee. And then 18 is a real difficult finishing hole, dog leg from left to right. So you had a lot of dog legs from right to left early, but now it's a little left to right action for your last hole. A lot of people will end up through the fairway and in, in these bunkers. If you hit it to the right, though, the bunkers to the miss, you know, to the left are, aren't the worst miss in human history. Um, if you miss to the right, it is one of the worst misses on property. So it's a real demanding tee shot. If you get it in the fairway, it's still a difficult green to hit as it's not very large. It has a lot of fall off areas 
in seemingly every single direction. Now that we've seen the golf course, let's go through some of our key stats of the week and the types of players that I'm looking for. And the number one thing I want to look at is this apex height stat, which I'm super glad that Bet the Number was looking at as well. They, of course, went out there, gave us all of that data to look at, and uh, wasn't something I had to add myself. So that's the beauty of being a part of Bet the Number, which of course is a huge partner here on the channel. Um, gives me the ability to look at stats for every golf course, which helps me a lot out um, over there for the prop side of things, but also right there modeling their insight, um, all the different modeling perspectives that they're putting together are based on in industry experience, right? They work with golfers on their strategy. They have a lot of analytics guys that are plugged in every single week on the PGA Tour. And you'll see down here, right? Apex height is a whole 10% in their modeling. So, you know, in my modeling, it's probably going to be 10, maybe 12 and a half percent out there with my exposure. Um, I didn't mean to go out there and run another model, but I love to see that they're taking a look at that as well. So they've got Mickelson up there. Uh, a lot of your high ball hitters like a uh, Keegan Bradley this year, Benny Ann, Bryson DeChambeau are all obvious candidates that you're looking at. But the real reason we're looking at apex height is to access some of the harder to get to pin locations, right? With how firm and fast these golf courses can play and with the sub air systems that they have at Augusta, um, I know they're calling for some rain, right? On Wednesday and Thursday, they're gonna be able to suck all of that out of the ground. So maybe for Thursday, it's a little bit softer, but as soon as Friday and especially right for Saturday and Sunday, it's gonna be back to the norma, normal Augusta National Golf Club. So um, still looking at apex height. Guys like Ludwig, right? It's his first time playing. So that experience is probably gonna be hard to deal with, right? The lack of experience, I should say, but a really good apex height type of player. Cameron Young, he's played here a few times now, right? Last time out was his best start. Um, a lot of the apex height I think is helpful there. Guys like Jason Day has a really good track record um, outside the last three times, I guess. But, you know, T5 has a few other top finishes around here. Um, of course, another guy who fits that perspective, Brooks Kepka, right? Second, right? Seventh and second place back in 2019. Really good apex height player. Rory McIlroy, of course, going for that, you know, to finish off the um, all the golf tournaments, the Grand Slam of golf. He's got to get a win at Augusta, right? He finished in second a few years ago. Uh, another apex height guy. Will Zalatoris, Minwoo Lee. Um, who, what did he finish here? T14 a few years ago, um, potential sleeper for this kind of week. Of course, Masters winner, Sergio Garcia. Patrick Cantlay has never played well here. Uh, let's see, I guess T9 in 2019 was his best start ever, but he's never been terrible, right? He had that one miscut in 2021, uh, really his his one real bad performance, but like T14, T17, T9, all respectable. But uh, a guy who's decent when it comes to apex height, Eric Cole, surprisingly, uh, is at least in the top half of Apex Height. Guys like Tony Finau also um, there towards the middle to top end of the board. The other key stat that I'm really happy that Bet the Number is looking at, makes my life a lot easier, right now having to do it, is looking at the long irons. And, you know, when we went hole, hole, hole by hole, right, you saw that a lot of the layups, right, force in like a mid to long iron into hand. And while some of the longer players might have like 120, maybe 150 yards quite often, um, everyone else, right, it's going to be this long irons all day. So um, if you're looking at just those shots in particular, you have guys like Nikola Hoyer up there guys like John Rahm right here towards the top of that list Hideki winner at this golf course Keegan Bradley another apex height kind of guy Joaquin Neiman got to see him at the live golf event this weekend uh, he was playing really well a lot better than his scorecard would indicate and he's another long iron specialist Scotty Scheffler winner here of course um, Kepka showing up again so it's not just you know the fact that he's a really good player at majors he's also checking a lot of the boxes when it comes to your advanced analytics Bryson DeChambeau again. I uh, have to say the iron play worries me, but really good when it comes to the long irons and apex height. Um, guys like Tony Finau, of course, good long iron players. Um, Xander's played pretty well here, right? Uh, what, a third, a second place finish to his record. Cameron Young, another solid long iron player. So uh, guys that are checking these two boxes to the right, right, from the irons perspective, really fit this golf course. And the real triple crown, right, is if you can match that up with just good old shots gained approach of late. So guys that do that, of course, Scotty Scheffler, we knew that, right? John Rahm, right, another player, we knew we were going to see that from. But Cam Smith, playing really solid with the iron play, um, has a decent apex height. He can launch the ball in the air. I've seen it in person before. Um, it maybe doesn't show up on the stats of late, which is a little bit concerning, but in the past was a player that I didn't have any issues with when it came to the apex height. So I like to see that. I like to see Will Zalatoris here. Um, long iron play has been surprisingly average of late, but 
Um, I'm not worried about his long iron play. He's uh, one of the better players in that category for sure. Um, Morikawa, no thank you. <laughs> Burned me last week, that's for sure. Xander showing up again. Decent apex height, right? Showing across, you know, at least three of those categories. Um, Hideki Matsuyama, again. Right, apex height, it's only there at 100 feet for an average apex height, but normally he has a much higher apex height than that. So I'm not worried about what that, that with Hideki. He can launch those irons up. Um, maybe that's a little bit of just noise variance right there. Uh, McElroy showing up. He gained seven strokes on approach last week, nearly seven and a half strokes over his four rounds at Valero. Um, obviously, a lot of people are going to be talking up Rory this week, but apex height, sure. You know, shots gained approach, sure. He's been okay with the longer irons, but... Once again, he, with his length, his longer irons are shorter clubs, right? I trust him a lot more than other players. DJ showing up, not really good with the long irons lately, but we know he can hit the ball high. We know that he's a really good putter, has won at this golf course before too. Um, that's got to count for something. Tiger Woods, low-key, still hitting the, the irons well. So if there's anything he's still doing well, it's that. But of course, right, uh, probably a long shot at best at this kind of week. Just, uh, you know, health, of course, holding the back. And the guys that are kind of lacking down here, like, I don't like to see guys like Hovland the whole way down here. Uh, Wyndham Clark is kind of expected. Uh, we'll talk about Wyndham a lot this week, I'm sure. He's a, he's a player that really fits this course. Apex Heidi checks that. He's a really good putter. Long irons are good enough for Wyndham Clark. And off the tee, right, you want to play him at courses where you can kind of miss it offline, right? And Augusta National with its lack of rough, unless you're hitting it with the water or into a deep, you know, patch of trees, you're probably going to be okay. And I kind of trust Wyndham Clark at this kind of golf course. So like that, Ludwig Aberg also showing up there. Uh, all players that you want to consider. And then the last key stat, you know, putting, it's not like we can completely ignore it, right? But I'm not going to take a look at it out here for the course breakdown. Again, if it, if there's anything that is slightly de-emphasized, it is the putting at this course. But uh, if you are an elite tier putter, that is obviously going to help you out. So you don't want to, you know, hold it against players. But around the green is important. This is an extremely difficult around the green course, um, maybe the hardest test that we have the entire year. And a lot of your top end finishers here are around the green specialists. So if we're looking at that of late, Denny McCarthy, uh, what a Sunday performance, I have to say, for good old Denny. Uh, obviously didn't, didn't get the job done, but a player that's really good around the green, Hideki showing up again. And, you know, if there's like an obvious play of the week, it's Hideki Matsuyama. He has to be chalk out there for DFS. It's probably going to be chalky out there for outright betting too, but I understand it. Literally checks like every box that we're looking for. Xander showing up. Guys like Jason Day again, right? So it's not just the apex height. It's also the around the green play that made Jason Day so good at this golf course. Patrick Reed, of course, a winner here showing up. Um, guys like Scotty Scheffler, Siwoo Kim, Russell Henley. Um, Sun jm has been low-key okay at this golf course, right? Second to eighth place finishes to his name. Guys like Harris English showing up, who's also, you know, he's at least... Eh, I guess not the great track record. I was going to say he's been decent here, but he's really just been okay over the last three, four years. Um, Cam Davis, Lucas Glover showing up again. Cam Smith, um, low-key has been a good course for him, right? Third, 10th, second place finishes, um, all before he really blew up out there in the PGA Tour. So over there on the Live Golf side, they don't have a lot of his finishes loaded in here. He's been kind of just decent lately. He hasn't been amazing out there on the Live Tour. But if he's a low-owned play for DFS, like, you bet your ass I'm going to play him, right, as a low-owned pivot for GPP. So um, we'll have to keep an eye on that. I don't know if it bet him outright. Yeah, 35 to 1 is definitely not the kind of number I'd be looking for. But a low-key, um, high-upside play when it comes to some of the fantasy formats. Um, Tommy Fleetwood there, he's just been okay at this golf course. Um, but a really good around-the-green player for sure. And then the last thing we'll go through here is, I guess, some of the pop putters, right? Um, guys like Fitz have been putting well. Patrick Reed putting well. I'm uh, not a surprise he's also been really good on the live tour of late, so that's good to see. Um, Brooks Kepka gaining a bunch of strokes in his measured rounds. Now, he switched putters. He's now using the Phantom putter um, out there from Scotty Cameron, I believe. So, interesting to see if that works out for him this time around. But the ball striking on live has been there of late. Um, the stats that we have for him, right, it's really just all been the putter. Um, of late over there in Live, it's all been the ball striking, right? It's been the tee to green play for Brooks Kepka that's been carrying him over there on that side. And uh, maybe that putter turns around, like you've seen for him at these big time events in the past. Xander Shoffley, again, like literally every category you're looking at, Xander Shoffley pops in. Another guy kind of like Hideki that I think is just by default going to be a very popular play this week. Doesn't mean that they're a bad play. In fact, I think they're great plays, but... They're definitely going to be very popular plays, so you're not going to be uh, very different, right, getting to those kind of players. So more so worries me for fantasy, but for outright betting, that sort of stuff, fire me up some Xander Shoffley, some Hideki Matsuyama. Um, Jordan Spieth there at uh, plus 2,000. 
Love my boy Jordan, but they got to hang a better number than that for for me to get a bunch of exposure. Uh, at least has been putting well lately, but everything else has been pretty trash. Um, outside of the off the tee play where he absolutely flushed it last week. You can see he gained five strokes off the tee. So uh, I'll probably dabble on some exposure on Jordan by the end of the week. But yeah, that outright number right now, that TFS price is not ideal uh, to say the least. Guys like Peter Malnati, Brian Harmon, Wyndham Clark showing up in the putting category. So once again, I, I'm looking at putting a little bit less than normal this week, uh, just because of the type of golf course that we have here, the types of in-tournament correlations that we've seen over the last three, four years, but you can't completely ignore it, right? Especially if somebody is putting well and checks one of the other boxes, right? So like Bryson with his apex height, you know, Cam Smith, he's been really good with the approach play when we have these, you know, shots gained rounds. Joaquin Neiman, for example, right, with his form and that putting, right, like you can't completely ignore those types of players. But if there's things that I'm looking at a little bit more, right, this approach play, right, to me is a lot more important, right? Like I care about the top 10 here a lot more than that top 10 of the putting statistics. So that's how I'm building some of my modeling this week um, and uh, the types of metrics that you might want to look at for some of your exposure. Comps for Augusta National aren't very plentiful, but the few that we have on the PGA Tour are extremely correlated, and it's for good reason. They're trying to simulate what you get at maybe what is the greatest course in the entire world. So the Texas Children's Houston Open, right, Memorial Park Golf Course, is this year especially, in the past, it was still simulation of what we got this week, was my number one comp course last year and the year before that, for that matter, for what we're getting for this golf tournament. But with the rough completely cut down this year, they cut it to like 1.3 inches, pretty much the same situation that we're getting this week. It is almost an identical type of golf course. Now it's a par 70 as opposed to a par 72, but there's little to no penalty off the tee, right? There are some trees out there that you can get into, very similar to an Augusta National. Not a bunch of water and green complexes and greens that ran extremely quick this time of year. With the overseed, right, they got it closer to what you'd see at Augusta and what are already some of the hardest greens on all the PGA Tour were playing even harder this year. So while the ball striking was easier, there was a lot less rough. There was, um, I would say, slightly softer greens um, here this time around. The speed of the greens, uh, the difficulty of the around the green shots with how um, firm the turf was, how perfect it was out there with the overseed was what made this golf course so difficult. So of course, Steven Yeager ended up winning, but you had a who's who of some of your ball strikers at the top. I mean, like Toasty, an absolute striper, Scotty Scheffler, of course, Tony Finau up there, Aaron Rye, right? Guys that are some of the best ball strikers in all the PGA Tour. And uh, no one that really faked it around that golf course, right? Like all of these players towards the top, literally all of them, even David Skins, right, were coming in with good form, right? Like David Skins had nearly won the Cognizant, right? Taylor Moore had gone on like a three, four event stretch on an absolute heater, right? Thomas Dietrich already been in contention a few times this year. Toasty, right, coming in off a few really solid performances, right? Top 10 finishes. Um, Jaeger had solid form himself. Nobody faked it around that golf course. And I think that's something to note right out there for Augusta. You can't come in with bad form and find a lot of success. So whether it was the greens, I think there's a lot of crossover there. Um, just from the ball striking perspective, I think it's a similar test of what you're going to get this week. So you can look at the last few years of Houston Open data, but I think this last iteration, right, if you played it, you got a really good idea of what you're going to see from these players. So this is what I'm looking at um, from that comp. If you take a look at the rest of the top 10, like Tom Hoagie played pretty well at a course with a little bit less emphasis off the tee. Uh, you can see why that would happen, right? A player that I tailed. Um, Akshay Batia played pretty well there too. Of course, coming in off a win, the late exemption into the golf tournament. So maybe he's worth a few looks. Um, Mackenzie Hughes up there. Victor Perez was striping it with the irons all week. Year before that was Tony Finau that won, of course. Right, had a pretty solid finish this time around too, right, with the T2 finish. So uh, I think that helps out Tony Finau a lot. He's also had some success at Augusta um, National. Um, Alex Norn showing up again, so maybe worth a few looks. Um, Aaron Rye, who I'm not sure if he's in the Masters this year. If he is, probably a, a sleeper play. I should know that off the top of my head, but yeah, Aaron Rye, absolute striper. But it's more so about the types of players that we're looking at here, right? It's Guys with a complete game, maybe slightly less emphasis on the putting. Right? Any tournament where Tony Finau is going to win is a, is a tournament where you don't have to be a top-tier putter to win. The next comp I'm going to look at is the Century Tournament of Champions. So it's our first event of the year. Um, it's over there in Hawaii. It is a par 73. But once again, you have these large green complexes, not that much of a penalty off the tee. Um, some of the largest landing areas on tour. 
pretty similar to what we get at Augusta National in greens that have a lot of undulation to them and are quick. It's about the par five scoring. That's where you get a lot of your birdie opportunities this week around Augusta National. And uh, if we take a look at some of the guys that had success this year over the past few years, Jordan Spieth showing up. He's somebody that um, has one of the better track records at Augusta National of all time. Guys like Scotty Scheffler again, but he shows up everywhere. Not so much of a surprise. Sun GM, Xander Shoffley, um, Jason Day, of course, one of your course horses for this week, um, shows up there with the top 10. Let's go down to the year before that. So John Rahm, of course, won. You know, and, and part of the reason I played Rom and I, I took him for an outright when he ended up winning this event a few years ago was because of the Augusta National narrative, right? He had played pretty well there. And uh, because he won here too, I parlayed that into him winning the Masters that year. So uh, that was a pretty sweet way to set that up. But you also had Tom Hoagie up there. Tom Kim played pretty well there a few years ago. Tony Finau, again. I mean, the guy just shows up in category after category, even if he's not playing that well right now. Like he's, he's been okay lately, right? Take a look at his profile over here. Um, let's see, can we get the starts to load up? Yeah, right. Obviously, T2 is his best start in quite some time. The stats aren't overly impressive, so I don't think he's going to be super chalky this week. And uh, again, a guy that has shown up just time and time again. Then the last comp course we're going to go with here, and there's a few different ways we could go with this. There's uh, um, three or four that I think it makes sense. I think the Players' Championship would be a pretty good one from the around the green perspective. So if you want to take a look at that for some stuff, uh, I don't think it's the worst idea. Um, RBC Heritage even, I think just because it's not a huge off the tee course, you could take a look at that. Some, uh, shot shaping that's required around there. Also some difficult greens. Let's see. I'm just trying to give you guys a few to work with here. Memorial has too long a rough for me to really look at it too closely. And, uh, I guess East Lake, right? For the tour championship. It's a golf course that requires shot making. It's a real difficult course around the green, right? Scrambling rate. Um, I guess the last few years hasn't been that bad. 2024 in particular wasn't terrible, but uh, another course that you could look at there too. So my top two comps are definitely my, you know, the ones that I would focus on the most out there. But uh, yeah, there's a few other courses that you can mix in for some analysis that uh, I'll probably be weighing in like one to maybe 2% out there in my custom model. Alrighty guys, that is all I've got for the course breakdown video. Before you hopping out of here, go ahead, smash that like button for me and also subscribe for all the content throughout the week. We're gonna be doing some fantasy content, some betting content here today. So make sure to keep an eye out for that for all the different types of players that I'm looking at to get some exposure to. We'll talk some GPP exposure, some value plays towards the bottom and also some outrights in top five and top tens that I'm looking to get to this week. It's an elite tier field. It is maybe the best week of the entire year. So let's go out there and take advantage. So best of luck, whether you're getting to any exposure on the betting side, just watching as a fan and uh, enjoy it out there, right? It's, it's our Super Bowl of the year. Let's enjoy it, right? Try and take some time off work if you can. And even if you're out there in the office, maybe your boss will let you, you know, put the phone to the side and do some streaming. Who knows? Uh, maybe you'll have to work on that a little bit, uh, do a little bit extra here on a Tuesday or Wednesday uh, to earn those brownie points for the weekend. It's worth it, I promise you. Um, when I was still working as an engineer, it's something that I used to do I'm out here for Master's Week. And uh, now that I work in the industry, right, I don't work as an engineer anymore. Um, you know, I have a little bit more freedom to go out there and watch, but I, I empathize with all of you guys out there. Appreciate it. Go ahead, give me your winning score prediction down below for a chance to earn a free month of my Patreon page. So of course on there is where I post all my fantasy analysis, all the different prop analysis that I'm getting to for every single tournament. On there on the prop side, I post averages, predictions for every single slate. So I'll go out there, give you the expected field averages for rounds two, um, one through four. And of course, some of the slips that I'm getting to. So there's a prop side on there. There's also the DFS side where I'm posting all the spreadsheets that I use throughout my content. And for a chance to earn a free month of that, like I said, go ahead and give me your winning score prediction down below. If you can get that for the Masters, you will earn a free month of that Patreon, which will put you through the RBC Heritage uh, to a month from now. So uh, go ahead, give me your prediction down below. And just, I guess for my documentation, I'm going to take four, I was going to say 15, but we're going to go with 14 under par. So that'll be my official guess. Go ahead, give me your thoughts down below, and let's have ourselves a week for this Masters tournament.